Hello everyone, welcome to another Talking Feds one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to be talking a lot about a central, sinister, somewhat cryptic figure in the whole uh, Trump uh, scandals and trials, namely one John Eastman. And we're really lucky to have with us today Matthew Seligman, who is a partner at Stris and Marr in uh, LA, but and also a fellow at the Constitutional Law Center at Stanford Law School and co-author of the book, How to Steal a Presidential Election, something he knows a little bit about um, personally from his uh, own work. Um, Matthew, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So let's just start out. You're a partner. You're at the Stanford Law Center, but uh, whether in those roles or others, you were integrally involved in um, investigating John Eastman. You were asked to be a expert witness in his recent bar disciplinary hearings. Just uh, set the table for us a little, please, about your great um, partnership, as it were, or um, focus on John Eastman, how it came to be, and what it uh, grew into in the last few years. Sure. It was it was amazingly serendipitous, as these things often are. So my background is uh, I'm a lawyer and also a legal scholar. And in 2016, I started teaching at Harvard Law School. Um, and at that time, I started thinking about disputed presidential elections because you know, then candidate uh, Donald Trump had said that he wouldn't accept the results of the 2016 election uh, if he lost. And so I started thinking about ways that the legal system could be manipulated to steal a presidential election. Um, and so that was one of my primary academic focuses. And then fast forward to uh, 2020, and I co-taught a seminar with uh, Lawrence Lessig, who's a professor at Harvard Law School. Um, we co-taught that seminar at uh, Harvard in the fall of 2020. And actually, and, and a quixotic presidential candidate himself. And presidential, uh, one-time presidential candidate, uh, Lawrence Lessig. And so we co-taught this seminar about how to steal a presidential election in real time. And so it was called Wargaming Ooh. 2020, and we were sort of... I do some teaching. Great idea. Oh, man. Awesome. Okay. You're lucky students. Sorry. Keep going. So we thought, it, you know, we were really, really scared about what might happen because we had looked, uh, each of us, into the various ways that the legal system could be manipulated. Um, but we didn't really anticipate the kind of uh, events that ultimately unfolded in 2020. You know, it, it, almost embarrassingly, in retrospect, neither of us really thought that there would be the kind of violence that there was on January 6th. Um, and we also had thought that the Trump campaign, the Trump world, was likely to try to do what they could. But in a lot of ways, what they tried to do was to steal the election in the dumbest way possible, in a way that was guaranteed to fail. And just in general, I just, I don't mean to interrupt you too much, but, you know, it was so brazen. And in Trump world, you just find again and again, the incredible, the impossible, the inconceivable becomes the actual and and the historical in, you know, real time as you're watching. It's a remarkable circumstance. Yeah. And from an academic perspective, we were seeing these hypotheticals that we had imagined unfolding in real time. Um, and it's, you know, interesting, but also horrifying. Um, so after January 6th, fast forward uh, to October of 2021, um, and uh, the famous Eastman memos uh, were released to the public. And so these are the two and six page memos where John Eastman, who had been uh, a private attorney for Donald Trump and his campaign, had laid out the basic strategy of how they were going to try to overturn the 2020 election through Vice President Mike Pence. Um, and through a serendipitous connection, uh, Larry happened to have been John Eastman's uh, 1L contracts professor. Um, and so Larry reached out to John and said, hey, would you like to come on this podcast that we had done episodes uh, for in conjunction with our class? And, and John said yes. Um, so we did this 90-minute wow. uh, discussion back and joke forth. here. Yeah, okay. And, you know, it's it's remarkable in retrospect um, that John was uh, willing to do it. Um, but we, we had this 90-minute uh, debate back and forth about sort of a lot of the legal issues at the core of what and, he proposed. And when exactly is this? This is in October of 2021. 
Okay, so so the big events that and and his uh, role in a criminal conspiracy, as alleged, is well past at this point. It's well past, although he knows he's in jeopardy. So it, it's pretty remarkable. Yeah. He knows he's in jeopardy, but none of the charges against him had been filed yet, and so it was this intermediate point where you know people thought there might be legal consequences for what happened, but it, it wasn't certain. Um, and so we we did this debate about his various legal theories, um, and I wrote a paper afterwards uh, debunking the core idea that the vice president has the power. Um, in presiding over the electoral count to take some kind of unilateral action. Eastman's like ultimate theory um, was it all hinged on that. Um, and he made some claims about, you know, well, this is the way that the founders actually understood uh, the role of the president in the Senate, who you know, the vice president is the president in the Senate. Um, and so I went back and I looked, um, which it turns out uh, neither he and nor- And by the way, so Matthew, you say this was a debate. So he's he's out in Chapman or where if he was still permitted to be there and yeah. just arguing with you or was it more a discussion where he and by the way, you know, gracious of him to do it, I guess. But um, who, wh who was the opponent? Yeah, so it was a discussion, but we clearly had different points of views. And I pressed him you know, quite a bit on his the basis of his theories, as did Larry. So it wasn't structured as a formal debate. It was, you know, it was a discussion where we clearly had different and opposing points of view. Understood. Okay. Um, and and so I wrote a paper after that uh, explaining why his core theory about uh, Vice President Pence just had no legal or historical basis whatsoever. Um, and it was a quick paper, you know, and, but I thought it made the point. After that, uh, the California Bar reached out to me. Um, and they said, you know, we're thinking of bringing disciplinary charges against uh, John Eastman. Are you willing to talk to us? And um, and that's where my involvement uh, in the legal proceedings began. Uh, and so I had uh, something it. of a and so and and we've been following that of late, and, and it has been you know a train wreck for um, Professor um, Eastman, and we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, yeah, that the whole theory. I think it's uh, one of, you know one of my better lines, but I likened it to saying that the person who opens the envelope to announce the Academy Awards by for that reason can just change and decide who, who wins the Oscar. Um, so, it, I mean, it was always outlandish, and but it's interesting. I have one question before moving to the disciplinary proceedings. You said that Eastman had been a lawyer for Trump before. You know, in general, the theme, uh, it seems a, an important theme in December and January is that any port in a storm and somebody like a Jeff Clark or a John Eastman, just by virtue of being willing to spout Trump views and a real minority of, of people in the bar, came to uh, the attention of the president and came to serve a pretty big role. We have an almost indelible picture of Eastman talking on the ellipse with his fedora or whatever kind of kind of, uh, you know, outfit he had. How is it that he, and, and of course, by the way, this really matters because Trump is um, now legally kind of making hints of an advice of counsel defense. And to the extent he's revealed the counsel, uh, it, it is in fact, Professor Chapman. So was he already a pretty close uh, advisor and trusted lawyer to Trump or did he come to prominence to, and and a kind of architect's role in uh, December and January just because he was espousing this nutty theory? Uh, I think it's mostly the latter. So his involvement, you know, he started participating uh, with the Trump campaign's legal efforts over the course of the fall of 2020, um, but he really took on the singular role in December of 2020. And something that you pointed out there is, you know, there were other lawyers around, including the campaign's lawyers who team were saying normal, that this, I think they were called versus team crazy. Yeah, right. And, you know, so and something that I think is important to recognize is that, uh, you know, team crazy as uh, as you called it, you know, there were two dimensions. Vice President Pence, too. Well, team, <laughs> what President do you call Pence. them? Knucklehead and a team, uh, a strong epithet for him. Sorry, a, a strong ahead. epithet, you know, and. One of the entry points into this uh, membership in this team is the factual conspiracy theories about dead people voting and so on. Um, but the other entry point uh, was these legal theories about how to try to 
change the outcome after the litigation had failed. You know, we have disputed elections, you know, most famously in um, living memories, Bush v. Gore, where the courts decide these things, the Supreme Court decides the case. And once that happens, it's over, even if you disagree with the outcome. Um, you know, Al Gore famously, you know, strongly disagreed with the outcome in Bush v. Gore, but he conceded the next day and wished, um, you know, the president-elect well. And then little known historical fact, he was the vice president. He presided over the electoral count on January 6th of 2001. The poignancy of that, yeah. And so, you know, he abided by his proper constitutional role. And so it wasn't just these factual conspiracy theories about Dominion voting machines and dead people voting and so on. It was also this legal conspiracy theory about how to bypass the courts to try to change the outcome. And that ultimately went directly through Vice President Pence. Very good. Okay. So as you've put it, uh, Eastman's legal theory was the core of the legal coup in 2020. Now, you know, people have in shorthand, uh, uh, tended to disparage it, and and um, uh, but you you've looked at it much more closely. I want to talk about your the actual role in the um, disciplinary proceeding, but why don't you you have a much fuller exposition of what's wrong with um, the the theory that Pence could have just uh, you know uh, changed the outcome. And um, or, you know, I think it would have been adequate for these guys if he had just um, kept kept it endowed and create sowed bedlam and chaos. And then, as Trump put it, my my guys in Congress will take care of it. Um, so can I let's for, let's start, however, with your um, thoughtful and comprehensive account of just what's uh, so much hooey about the uh, the Eastman uh, theory, because you've you've looked into it and written about it as a scholar. So, you know, and in some respects, this is why I entered into the scene in the first place. I, you know, most sane people, I think, heard this theory and immediately dismissed it as nonsensical because it's just a crazy way to design uh, a legal system where the vice president gets to decide whether the vice president and the president uh, gets you know, wins the election. That's that's just a, a way of designing a legal system that is completely antithetical to the rule of law. And I think that for the vast majority of people, they thought that was the only thing that needed to be said in response to that. And uh, I think that's right. Uh, I also think that, you know, for the purposes of these disciplinary proceedings and ultimately the criminal trials, I wanted to go deeper. You know, because what Eastman had claimed, now he was a law professor, he was a Supreme Court clerk for uh, Justice Thomas, this is somebody who had, you know, credentials, was making this claim that this is what the founders meant. You know, you may not like it, just like meant you may not. by the 12th Amendment? Or the 12th Amendment. And, you know, there's a little bit of fuzzy. Which when, by the way? Because it's not the first ten. 1804. So th there's a little bit of fuzziness about sort of the, you know, when are we talking about the original meaning between, you know, 1789 versus 1804. Um, but ultimately, you know, he said that founding period that they understood um, the relevant parts of the Constitution, which after 1804 is the 12th Amendment, uh, to give the president and the Senate this power. You know, and the, the idea is like, you may not like it, just like you may not like the Second Amendment, you know, giving gun rights, but, you know, tough. That's what the Constitution... It's a Constitution we are expounding, right? Right, exactly. And, you know, so I, I think that there is, you know, I, I don't... So that wouldn't be a good argument, even if there was some historical evidence, just because, you know, I think that the, the idea that this is a crazy way to design a democracy ultimately is a, a cogent argument. But I wanted to address what Eastman was saying on his own terms. So he was saying there was all this historical evidence that uh, that this is how the system worked. Um, he said that both uh, John Adams in 1797 and Thomas Jefferson in 1801 had actually done this, that they had decided the, they were the vice president in each of those elections, and they had actually done this and you know counted themselves into the presidency, um, as one Law Review article put it. And so I wanted to take his claims on their own terms to say, okay, let's look at the historical evidence. Let's, let's go to the tape and see what actually happened. And once I did that, it was absolutely clear that there was no historical evidence whatsoever that anyone in the founding generation thought that the president and Senate had this power. None. And so this isn't one of those situations where, you know, okay, historians can differ and like, 
you know, okay, so... So you did the whole, what, Federalist Papers and and whatever debate there was on the 12th Amendment and uh, et cetera? Yeah, and m- m- there was very little discussion of this issue for the most part. Um, and there were really two principal pieces of historical evidence that are relevant to this. Uh, the first was the records of the actual electoral counts. And so I looked at those records in, uh, in the House Journal and the Senate Journal and the Annals of Congress for every pres- presidential electoral count in history. Um, And the ones that are particularly relevant for these purposes are the ones that go up through the middle of the 19th century. And you can read exactly what happened in Congress. And they actually, you know, in on the sort of PDF parchment paper in the Library of Congress, you, you can see it written out where there are these, you know, tables where they counted up the electoral votes. And it is absolutely clear that Congress did the counting. And whenever there was any kind of dispute that arose, and the first time that happened was in 1817, whenever there was any kind of dispute that arose, Uh, Congress exercised the sole and exclusive power to resolve the dispute, and no one, not a single person, suggested that the president and Senate had any power or role in that until 1857, when it was brought up only because someone was saying, this is absurd, and of course, that can't be correct. Right. And just quickly, so so and, and Eastman himself, did he have some snippet of history that he bastardized, or was it just Ipsa Dixit made up, or just the sheer fact that uh, these two early presidents had immediately precedent been vice presidents. So he had, so he talked about these two historical incidents in uh, 1796 uh, and 1800, those two elections. And he relied on his interpretation of some law review articles and in particular one law review article. Um, And so as we're talking about this historical, those historical incidents in detail, And so what he's saying is, well, they were the vice president and there was a dispute that arose about electoral votes. Um, It was Vermont in 1796 and it was Georgia um, in 1800. And he says uh, that they resolved the dispute themselves. And the vice presidents themselves. Yeah. Okay. Um, And and he just says so or does he have a, you know, a letter from, you know, to Abigail Adams just resolve the, you know, anything. So what he has is a law review article that was published in 2004. Um, and it, but that's not original historical evidence. Obviously. No, um, but the law review article talked about those two incidents. Now, one of the things that's interesting about Eastman's utilization of this article is what the article says is that Adams definitely didn't exercise any kind of unilateral authority um, in 1796. And it says... Maybe, although it's a really vague, you know, kind of suggestive, doesn't really come out and claim it, says that maybe Thomas Jefferson kind of did, but he exercised historical uh, discretion and constitutional statesmanship by not creating a, a conflict. And ultimately, the article doesn't present any evidence whatsoever that either of these two people um exercised any unilateral control. And man, these are two very different, I mean, they're, they're the, almost the definition of the electoral system that we don't have um, today. All right, so all wet, even by his own terms. Okay, let's flash forward then. So, uh, you know, af- now you get the call from the disciplinary uh, committee and tell us about the role. You're, it, it's technically still ongoing. Yeah, it's been held again. Uh, the trial court has has uh, recommended that it that he be stripped but it's it's an automatic review to the California Supreme Court is that tell is that right but but and tell us about your role in the overall uh, disciplinary proceeding sure so the it's the trial's over and the trial court has ruled um, uh, last month it recommended uh, his permanent disbarment and so what that means is that's the trial court's decision. And now it goes up on appeal. There's an intermediate appellate court uh, that will review the case. And then it goes to the California Supreme Court. Um, And the reason why it's only a recommended disbarment is that technically speaking, the California Supreme Court has to issue the actual order for him to be disbarred. Um, But that's just a different way of talking about sort of an ordinary appellate um, process where, you know, the trial court has rendered its decision and now it can be appealed up. Uh, to the California Supreme Court. So that's... Yeah, which still- I, I mean, I'm a member of the bar there, and I think somebody once signed something on behalf of the California Supreme Court. They regulate bar stuff. Um, uh, okay, so it's not a... F- uh, he, he cannot practice law for now, and he will we'll see uh, his 
how, how if he gets any purchase in the higher courts, but it seems pretty, um, well, the case seems strong. Tell us um, in particular the role you played in the trial. So I had two roles. One was before the charges were filed and the other was after. Uh, before the charges were trialed, so I played no role in making any decision about what uh, the California bar was going to do. Right. Um, but but they wanted to ask me some questions about how the Electoral College works, about the 12th Amendment, and so on. And the reason is because this is different than uh, than other types of bar discipline cases that usually come across their desk. Um, it you know implicates these you know deep questions of early 19th century constitutional history um, that not too many people know about. And so they wanted to make sure that whatever decisions they made, and ultimately it was their decisions, um, whatever decisions they made. Uh, it would be ironic if as expert you, you arrogated to yourself the power to decide the ultimate right. because, yeah. Yeah, and look, I, I, I think it would have been improper and I wouldn't want that power and so on, you know, but they asked me questions about how the Electoral College worked and, and I answered those questions. And then after the charges uh, were filed, then I became a testifying witness. And so they asked me to write an expert report and then testify at trial against him. Uh, so I filed my report in May of last year, and then I testified in August for about two days. Um, and, and your expertise was about the meaning of the 12th Amendment, yeah? That's right. And so primarily about the role of the of the vice president, but also there were a couple of other issues that come up as well. So uh, Eastman advocated the view that... Um, and still advocates the view uh, that state legislatures can uh, reclaim the power to appoint electors at any time. And he's quoting out of context a late 19th century Supreme Court case called McPherson. And he's he's made the claim that, you know, after January 6th, state legislatures could uh, appoint electors, um, you know, and even up until today, they could somehow rescind their electoral votes. Right, right. That one's the most amazing. And is this a sort of Article One, set, you know, Section Four, more v. Harper loose uh, uh, kind of claim, or so it's it's the analogous provision in Article Two. So Article Two, Section One. I'm such a nerd, I can't stop myself from asking the legal questions. Although, well, you know, I the, fear the listeners are less interested. Too. Yeah, you know, so so there's an analogous. So more v. Harper and the independent state legislature theory is relevant here. And so more v. Harper was about Congress's. Uh, power and state legislatures power uh, to determine the manner of, uh, of congressional elections. Um, and this is about uh, state legislatures power uh, to determine the manner of presidential elections. And so that's in Article 2, Section 1, Clause 2. All right. And I'm going to stop us going down this road, which <laughs> I launched us on. So and I, I, I and just back to the trial for a moment. Um, you were subject to cross-examination, yeah? What what did uh, Eastman's counsel try to uh, elicit from from you? And, you know, how did they, he try to poke holes in your expert testimony, if at all? Or she? Um, so there was some non-substantive stuff, you know, about, you know, just sort of trying to attack my credentials and things like that. Um, and in addition to that, on the substance, you know, the, the cross-examination didn't really delve into... Um, the actual historical evidence from the founding era. Instead, it focused um, on two things. One uh, was, you know, I mentioned this law review article, um, you know, and I think that the idea um, behind the defense counsel strategy there was to sh to try to establish not that Eastman was right about the Constitution, but that it was, in the words of the defense counsel, tenable, that it was sort of an arguable question. Don't kick someone out of the bar for, for you know, just discussing uh, tenable theory, something like that. Yeah. Right, exactly. And uh, and the strategy to try to to try to show that, I think, by the defense counsel was first to talk about some really vague and inconclusive legal scholarship um, from you know 2004 and a couple of other uh, recent articles as well. And then also to talk about um some political rhetoric from the late 19th century. So, you know, Eastman didn't make up this idea from whole cloth in the sense that he was not the first person to ever say that the vice president might have that. Well, you mentioned 1857, right? So, yeah. Right. Like um, and it was, you know, it was mentioned once then, but really the first time was actually discussed in any depth whatsoever was in 1876. And, um, you know, for presidential election junkies, this rings a bell, because this was the um, 
famous for us, a uh, disputed presidential election of 1876 that uh, you know was the most cataclysmic disputed presidential election in American history. And there was no congressional statute governing the electoral count at the time. Um, the Republicans controlled uh, the Senate. The Democrats controlled the House of Representatives. They couldn't agree on these disputed electoral votes from three southern states um, and one elector from Oregon. And that would decide the election. This was 10 years after the Civil War. It was sort of a perfect storm. Right. It's a per it's a great final exam for your and Larry's uh, class, and maybe this a different one on one. Um, let me just, however, I, here's where I'd like to. So, on the one hand, this is a fairly, um, I think you could say, you know, I, it's it's too bad for Professor Eastman, but an encouraging story of accountability and the systems, you know, responding to some pretty pernicious and what could have been really damaging uh, faux theoretical work on his part. Um, but I think we need to end on a bit of a downer, uh, or, or I at least want to ask you, because you've said the threats to the system remain, uh, in your words, dangerously unprotected against a smarter and more sophisticated attempt in 2024. So could you just sketch out for us your your concern and if there you have any thoughts about what might be uh, done to shore up the system against the risk? Yeah, so uh, the risks fall in somewhat different places than where the focus was in 2020. Uh, most obviously, uh, the vice president is Kamala Harris, and you know I'm reasonably confident that she's not going to try to uh, interfere in the electoral count in an unconstitutional way. And so the question is, where else is the system vulnerable? Um, and there are two answers to that. The first answer is um, in Congress. Now, Congress passed the Electoral Count Reform Act uh, in 2022, which resolved a lot of the problems. There were some serious vulnerabilities um, that could have been exploited. And the most severe vulnerabilities have been um, narrowed, if not completely eliminated. But there are some that remain. Um, and so there are, there are risks in the process of counting electoral votes in Congress. Um, but more than that, I think that the risk rests in states. Um, so the way that the presidential election process works is that there's this handoff uh, like a baton. You know, the first part of the process is done by states and then, uh, you know, the baton is passed off uh, to Congress who counts electoral votes um, on January 6th. And I think it's in states and the role of state legislatures where, um, where the biggest risks uh, remain. So the most extreme types of options, um, like a state legislature passing a law that says that we're canceling the presidential election and we're going to appoint electors ourselves, that's on the table. Um, and the state legislature in Arizona has considered bills that say exactly this. Um, they've considered bills that say that they, you know, that they'll hold a, uh, a presidential election, but they reserve the right to, uh, to appoint other electors if they want to. Um, and this can be dressed up in sort of democratic sounding language like that the state legislature is, you know, sort of the final canvassing board. And then suddenly it turns out, oh, we think that all of the uh, precincts in Fulton County were hopelessly infected with fraud. So we're going to just disregard all the votes from Atlanta. And then suddenly it turns out that Trump wins, um, and, you know, the remaining votes. Those are the types of moves um, that aren't just traditional voter suppression of the type we've seen for you know all of American history, but are in this new wave of election subversion and sabotage after the ballots are counted, or I'm sorry, after the ballots are cast. Um, ways to manipulate the legal process. Those are the ones that um, I think are, are really the most dangerous in the states through the mechanism of the state legislatures, which are themselves hopelessly gerrymandered in favor of Republicans. Got it. And yeah, I'll just add two points to the, you know, fuel on the fire. The first is, as you say, it's, you know, we're, we're going to inevitably all everyone agrees come down to a handful of states and it may be the case in them, as it is the case generally, that the makeup of the legislatures are um, both uh, pro, if narrowly pro-Republican, and in a way that doesn't reflect the makeup of the voters because of the gerrymandering. That's one. And then two, and this takes us back to Bush v. Gore, these things play out, you know, the butterfly ballot, which which uh, insiders still think about and almost certainly uh, was pivotal in the election, but election uh, litigation is played out in a frenetic, time-compressed 
fashion where certain things actually uh, remedies that would seem just in a system that has all the time to provide are are off the table just because there's so you have to move so quickly. I mean, indeed, that's sort of what you can say. Eastman was, or at least Trump, wanted to do in a bottom line way, just make things uh, loosey goosey and chaotic, and in the very narrow band of time, you know, like Peter Navarro and the Green Bay sweep just get us to 10 p.m. on January 6. Shit hits the fan, is you know, in the legal term, and then uh, you know you can you can sort of thus are thus are autocracies and even you know um, revolutions uh, hatched in a in a constitutional democracy. Um, Matthew Seligman, thanks so much for being with us. So we got some stuff to think about and and watch because, as you say, so you know some of this is broached in plain sight, including by people who literally don't know better, legislators and the like. So there are people sort of looking after it. Uh, your role with John Eastman is done, but you you know served an important one in um, in the investigation of the of the bar. So kudos on that. And thanks for explaining the dangers that remain in what, by any account, is going to be, at a minimum, a close election. Well, thanks very much for having me. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video and other Talking Feds content, please take a second to like and subscribe. Talk to you later.